and welcome to week one, lecture four, our last lecture of the week. Today we'll be talking about coloring and Brooks' theorem. Brooks' theorem is one of the classical theorems in coloring, and we'll be getting to its statement, and next week it's proof. But today we'll be talking about coloring. So what is coloring? A coloring of a graph, G, is an assignment of colors to vertices of G such that no two adjacent vertices receive the same color. So it's a labeling, but wherein we've imposed a, a local constraint that adjacent vertices cannot receive the same color. Now graph coloring is one of the most studied areas of graph theory, and also one of the most storied. The history with the four color theorem, which you've probably heard of, and it all dates back the definition to the coloring of, of maps, where the faces are now what we think of as the vertices, and you didn't want adjacent faces to receive the same color. But here we're doing vertex coloring, so that's the coloring. And now what are we interested in? We're interested in usually in the number of colors we need, how many colors we need. To that end, we define a k-coloring, which so we say phi is a k-coloring if well, you map the phi to 1 up to k and then has this condition that phi of u is not equal to phi of v for every edge u v. And what's the deal with 1 to k? Well, we really don't care what the colors are called, so just for the rest of our class we'll always just assume they're integers and we'll always just assume they're positive integers and that it's, if we're talking about a k coloring, that it's 1 up to k. Uh, but because you can always just rename the color. So that's coloring and that's k-coloring. And while well, every graph has a coloring, even a, a k-coloring with a somewhat small k in that it has number of vertices as a v of size v of g coloring, so we're actually interested in the minimum number of colors needed to color g. If we're trying to optimize, we want to minimize that number of colors. Because not every graph might have a one coloring or a two coloring, etc. To that end, we define one of the most important parameters in, in graph theory, which is the chromatic number. So the chromatic number of a graph G, definition here denoted chi of G, so that's the Greek letter chi, is the minimum number K such that G has a K color. And it's a very interesting and hard parameter, and so that's what we'll be talking about. But maybe before we do that, let me just even back up and ask, why color it? So why would it be interesting to study color? You know, we're going to be spending the next number of weeks on it, it has, it's very storied, has many papers on it, but so why would you study coloring? So maybe pause the video for a moment and ask, answer this question, why coloring? Okay, so if you're back and see if some of our answers line up, I have a couple, uh, multiple different answers, depending on what you like, and let's begin. So one, I would just argue, before you even get to applications or anything, that coloring is a foundational problem. It's a foundational problem in graph labeling. So if you care about graphs, it's very natural to label graphs, to, to think of functions all on the vertices of a graph, which satisfy certain constraints. And this is kind of one of the most natural, one of the most basic constraints, right? That if we're trying to, to study a discrete function on the vertices of a graph, it'd be natural to impose that adjacent vertices uh, don't get the same value. And that's exactly what coloring is. Now you could do other things. You could have adjacent vertices get the same value, but then if you're connected, the whole thing is constant, and that's maybe less interesting, whereas this leads to interesting. And also it's clear you can kind of generalize this in a lot of different directions, and so it's, in some ways it's a foundational problem for the whole area of graph labeling or functions on graphs. From a different side, though, you can think of coloring not only as, as a labeling or function, but as a, a graph decomposition. So what if you want to decompose the vertices of a graph into certain kinds of subgraphs? And that's exactly what coloring is doing. It's decomposing it into color classes. So what is a color class? All the vertices that get the same color. And what is that? It's an independent set, right? You can't have any edges there. That's exactly the definition of an independent set. So we're actually decomposing the graph in independent sets. And so coloring actually is foundational in that sense. And then from there, you can even explore other types, other generalizations or variants of coloring. What if we want to decompose into graphs that are subgraphs that are bipartite, i.e. two color? Or what if we want to do maximum degree 10? Or what if we want them to be triangle free? And in that sense, they're all kind of various forms of coloring. So coloring captures really graph decomposition and graph labeling, both foundational areas of graph theory. It's maybe there for unfortunate, it's called coloring, it makes you think of kindergarten and, and coloring, and you tell your parents that you're doing coloring for a living, and they say, didn't you do that in kindergarten? 
but really it's a stand-in for both functions, a very serious math topic, and decomposition, very interesting with lots of practical applications, and a springboard to both of those. Beyond that, of course, then it actually, being so foundational, has many applications. That's probably what you thought of when I said why coloring. So it has applications to maps, if you want to color maps, cartography there. Scheduling, so if you want to schedule sporting events and things. Job processing, meaning for more for computers. So if you want to tell a computer if you have some number of, of servers or processors, in what order to do the jobs. Frequency assignment is another one. Think of cell networks and you want to tell certain phones what frequency they should be using to connect, uh, communicate with certain uh, cell towers. That's a coloring problem of a sense. So there's all these, these different applications in the real world to very relevant problems. And I would even argue more generally actually to algorithms. So coloring appears a lot, uh, you know, in other areas of combinatorics is kind of a, a black box but also to algorithms. So uh, one very good example is distributed computing. If you want the vertices uh, of a network to actually run a distributed algorithm, it's helpful to get them to uh, coordinate as if they were independent sets. So you have adjacent vertices not go at the same time. And what is that? It's actually finding or coloring. So even kind of creating a schedule for a distributed algorithm is actually just first finding a coloring in distributed time or distributed algorithm to find a color. And so that becomes a foundational problem for a lot of computing problems. And so those are all reasons for why coloring, but maybe also it's just beautiful and has lots of very nice classical theorems, nice proof techniques. And so we'll be looking at some of those. But if, if you need someone to tell someone why, you know, why are we studying this? Why coloring? Well, here's some, some different nice answers. Okay, well, let's go back to coloring. I've said coloring is foundational, but part of that is because it's hard, right? If it was just easy, it wouldn't have gotten as many papers and as much respect. And so in what sense? Well, let's try to go through and characterize, you know, when is a graph one colorable? When is a graph two colorable, etc. Well, one colorable is easy. You just can't have any edges, right? That's being an independent set. So it's by definition, being an independent set is equivalent to being one colorable. So that's not very interesting. Can I decide if I'm one colorable? Yes. Do I have an edge? Then no. If not, then yes. What about bipartite? Well, bipartite is actually by defini di definition equivalent to being two color, right? That's what the definition of bipartite was, split into two independent sets. And that's what it means to be two color. And indeed, coloring, if you think about it, is just a generalization of this bipartite, uh, somewhat intrinsic property, right? But instead of saying tripartite, we say three colorable, instead of quadpartite, four colorable, because it's just easy, because you then stop, for, stop remembering what the Latin things that should go in partite are, in front of partite. So can we decide about partite? Can we decide two colorable? Well, yeah, as you probably learned in undergraduate graph theory, G is two colorable if and only if G does not contain an odd cycle, and there's nice short proofs of that. And moreover, if you take spanning trees, there exists a poly time algorithm to decide if G is two colorable, right? You just take out the spanning tree and then you'll be able to detect either an on cycle or find the two color. So that's not very interesting, right? Two colorability. But then it gets really interesting. What about three colorable? Is there some nice characterization of being three colorable? We're three colorable if and only if maybe not odd cycles, but some crazy class of graphs. I mean, they have to be infinite as well, but Maybe there's a nice characterization, and the answer is really no, at least if we believe certain conjectures in complexity theory. Because Karp in 1972, as one of his 21 NP complete problems, showed that for each k at least three, deciding if graph G has a k coloring is NP complete. And that kind of says that unless you believe P is equal to NP, there is no nice characterization at least in this NP sense, right? Because if there was some easy way to tell that a graph doesn't have a three coloring, then you would actually have a nice algorithm and then P would reduce to it. And P would reduce to P and break that. So really coloring is hard, is the point of this slide. And actually it's very hard. Like three coloring is NP complete even for planar graphs. So even planar graphs, which you know by the four color theorem are four colorable, but deciding whether one's three or four is actually even NP complete. So even that part is hard. And any, actually you can show just by easy kind of blow up arguments that any constant factor approximation to coloring or chromatic number is also NP complete. So we can't even really approximate 
coloring well in general. So instead, we're going to look more at specific classes and specific bounds and try to show in those cases that we can get a good handle on the chromatic number. So that's what we'll do. So we'll talk about bounds on the chromatic number instead of actually trying to, to find it exactly. So let's talk about bounds. What are some bounds? Well, as we mentioned, chi is the most of the number of vertices of g, but that's not very, you know, it's very trivial, so that's not very interesting. Let's do better. How can we do better? Well, here's a nice one. It's called, we call it the greedy upper bound. Chi of g is the most delta of g plus one. So what is that? Well, delta of g here, if you haven't seen it before, denotes the maximum degree of vertices in g. So you take the maximum over all the vertices in g of their degree. That's delta of g, delta being the Greek letter there. And we argue that chi is the most delta of g plus one. So if you have a graph of bounded degree, it gives a nice bound on the chromatic number. That's very nice. And how do we do this? If you haven't seen it before, it's a greedy algorithm. What do I mean greedy? It's just kind of the silliest, stupidest thing you can do while still being correct. And how would that work? You order the vertices of G arbitrarily, V1, V2, all the way up to the last vertex V, V size V of G. And so you order them any, any way you want. It's amazing, any way you want. And then you color the vertices in order. You just greedily do it. V1, here's a color. V2, here's a color. Now, of course, that one gets your coloring, so you have to be slightly smart. You just avoid the colors of previously colored neighbors. So if V2 was adjacent to V1, just make sure you don't color the color of V1, and so on. Now, does this work? Can you always keep continuing? Well, yes, right? Since each vertex has the most delta of G neighbors, by the definition of maximum degree, there is always at least one color for the current vertex. So you just avoid your previously colored neighbors, that's the most of your degree, which is most delta of G. There's always a color left over for you. Greedy just works. So that's very nice, but it's very beautiful. So that's a very nice upper bound. What about lower bounds? Well, chi of g is at least omega of g. What's omega, if you haven't seen it before? That's a Greek letter and it denotes the clique number of g. What's the clique number? That's the maximum size of a clique in g. And if you haven't heard clique, that just means a complete graph. So it's the maximum size of a complete subgraph of g. And that's obviously a lower bound because just a complete subgraph, you need a different color for every vertex in that subgraph, for every vertex in the clique. Right, so the chromatic number of G is always at least the chromatic number of its subgraphs, and so we get this lower bound from the clique number. So we have this nice upper bound and kind of this nice lower bound. Now, max degree is, of course, easy to just test and, and algorithmically find. I will note that omega of G, the clique number, is actually also a hard parameter of graphs. It's hard to, to test and approximate, etc. So maybe that's you know, not the best kind of lower bounding from also a hard parameter, but at least these are two very natural, very nice parameters which kind of bounding our chromatic number. Okay, so what's natural, you know, so we do this, and then what's natural? Well, you could ask about, you know, improving bounds, and again, improving, because we always have a large color and we're trying to lower it, trying to minimize it, it's natural to ask, can we do better than the greedy upper bound, right? So I gave you some upper bound, it's coloring, you could always just ask, can we, can we push it, can we improve it, what conditions are needed? Etc. So just think for yourself uh, for a moment and pause and answer, you know, can we do better? Okay, well, you probably saw the answer. The answer is no. Why? The bound is tight for complete graphs, actually. And actually, they're kind of all tight there. So omega of kn is n, and that's equal to chi of kn, which is equal to n minus 1 plus 1, which is the maximum degree of kn, that's n minus 1 plus 1. So, all those bounds are all equal, they're all tight. So you can't actually do any better for complete graphs. So you should just stop, right? That's how math works. We asked, we had some bounds, could we do better? And we just said, well, no, so that's, that's it. We throw up our hands, there's no theorems, we're done. Well, no, that's not math. That's not how we operate. In math, we're always trying to learn more to ask more questions, you know? So if, you, if your original question wasn't the right question, you should tweak it. So here, you know, can we do better than greedy? No. Well, then there's a kind of a natural next question, which is, well, could we do better if the graph is not complete? We thought about it for a moment. We said complete graphs, it's tight for, and then we're like, well, maybe they're somehow the only, the only problem, right? So think for a moment and, and come back so you can pause the video, answer this question. Can we do better? And what? if we can. Well, no. The graph, actually, there's kind of a sneaky reason. I'll get to the other one you're thinking of, but first there's a sneaky reason. The graph could have a component that is complete, right? So I never said the graph was connected. 
And then, you know, you can always pass the subgraphs and, and get a lower chromatic number, or greater than equal at least. So if you had a, a disconnected graph, and one of its components was a complete graph, a KM, where, you know, N was actually the maximum degree of the whole graph, you know, plus one, then that component would also show the whole thing's type, irregardless of whether you add uh, other isolated vertices. So actually, you know, makes sense then for this question and for coloring to really look at only components, to only look connected graphs, right? Because the chromatic number of a graph is the maximum over its components. So maybe we, again, being mathematicians, change the question. We said, well, that was stupid. I meant to only ask it about connected graphs. So we can do, but can we do better if the graph is connected and not complete? So again, pause the video if you want and answer this question. You might know the answer. Well, no, right? There's one last stupid thing. It's tight for odd cycles. The bound is tight for odd cycles. So greedy is tight. Why? Chi of C2K plus 1 is 3. Odd cycles, triangles, 5 cycles, 7 cycles that need 3 colors because of the parity. That's exactly the bipartite proposition we had. And that's 2 plus 1, which is the maximum degree of cycles is 2 plus 1. So it's not tight to the clique number, of course, because it's not complete, if, at least if K is bigger than 2 there but at least two, but it is still tight to the greedy bound. So again, we ran into this procedure. We tried, complete graphs, okay, oh, maybe it's disconnected, let's make it connected. Now we ran into odd cycles. So we kept trying and we kept hitting walls. So we should really just give up. But again, no. We just, you know, you find more problems, maybe you say, let's, let's push through. Maybe that's the only problem. Can we do better if the graph is, not, is connected and it's neither complete nor an odd cycle. So let's just throw them all in. Maybe these are the only examples. You know, let's assume it's connected so you don't get the stupid thing where you just add isolated vertices and such. And then let's throw it complete, let's throw it odd cycles, because those are the ones we found so far, the ones we knew about. But maybe there are more. So what's the answer to that question? Well, that's the point of this talk. The answer is yes. Yes, these are the only exceptions. That's amazing. That's beautiful, right? That's actually a theorem. And that theorem is called Brooks' theorem, after Brooks, who's actually a friend of Tut, one of the founders kind of of this uh, CNO department, uh, back when they uh, were in university. And he proved this very beautiful theorem that if G is connected, then chi is in most delta. So you're only saving one here. You know, we got from delta plus one down to delta, but we can save a color. We can make sure that that greedy upper bound is not tight, but if and only if G is neither complete nor an odd cycle. Those are really the only two classes of exceptions. And otherwise, we can do better. That's an extremely, you know, beautiful theorem, and it's classical, going almost on 80 years now. Has many different proofs, so next week we'll be covering some of the proofs. But I just wanted to walk you through the motivation, right? So coloring, very natural. It's hard, so we look to bounds. Here are some natural bounds. Can we do better? Well, no, there are various examples, the issue with the connectivity, odd cycles, all there, but can we still do better? That's what math's about. Can we do better? And here, Brooks said, yes. You know, that's it. Those are the only ones. So that's just a very beautiful classical theorem in coloring, and that's why we have it in this course. So stay tuned for next week when we'll pick up with a proof of Brooks' theorem, first informally and then more formally, and then continue on talking about kind of extensions beyond Brooks' theorem. Well, until then, have a good weekend and see you next week.